afternoon, and welcome to the Sake Brewers Association of North America's second webinar. My name is Bernie Baskin. I'm the executive director. And today we're joined by Monica Lee, the beverage director of Daikaya in Washington, DC. We're joined by Chris Johnson. You probably know him as the Sake Ninja. He's also out of New York City. Uh, Russell King, the co-owner of Hanyato Restaurant in Seattle, Washington and Jamie Graves, the Japanese Portfolio Manager at Skernick Wines and Spirits in New York City. Thank you uh, so much for being here today. Uh, today we're going to talk about selling sake in your bar and restaurant. And we have a really interesting collection of people from around the globe who are tuning in to watch us uh, from all over the place, Australia, Japan, Sweden, the UK, obviously the United States. Uh, Brazil, and we are delighted that everybody could be here to talk about building a successful sake program, educating your consumers, and hopefully increasing your sales. Um, we are going to be taking questions throughout the webinar, and so if you have questions, go ahead and uh, send them through the chat, and we'll try to incorporate a few here at the end. Uh, but I want to get us started and kind of make sure that everybody's on the same playing field here. So Chris, I'm going to turn to you. What is sake? Just very briefly, I know you could talk about this for an hour, but why don't you give us just a minute or two explanation of what is sake, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, well, sake is uh, the national beverage of Japan and it is a wonderful, special key to my heart and probably the, the five of us on this, this seminar uh, component uh, that, that we enjoy quite often, but the basics is Sake is a fermented beverage uh, made from rice. Um, people often, when writing articles, refer to it as a spirit, which is uh, very, very far from the truth. Um, so sake, rice being the main ingredient, um, fermentation being the key component of getting the alcohol, it is made from really just four things, uh, rice, water, yeast, and a little guy called koji, or aspergillus arise probably said that wrong, but that's why I always say koji, because uh, it's way easier for all of us. Um, but sake, because of the way it's, it's produced, uh, gives us a, a plethora of aromatics and flavor profiles that rival and it sometimes surpass wine in, in the depth of, of, of components. And this is a beverage that because of the fermentation process called dual parallel fermentation, uh, really creates all these amazing um, flavors and because we do this thing with the koji, and I'll explain that really quick in a second, uh, we're able to get um, something that we know as umami or uh, that delicious flavor or that savoriness or as we love to say in English because we're really good at words, uh, the yummy factor. Uh, sake is, is this, this beverage that simply put again, rice, water, yeast, and koji, fermentation. The conversion of starch to sugar happens at the same time in the same tank, which is where the dual parallel fermentation comes from. Uh, and we do a lot of different things to the rice. The rice is important. Uh, sake rice looks a lot like a hard boiled egg, yolk in the middle, pure starch. The more you mill to get close to that pure starch, more elegant, more layered, uh, more complex the sake gets. Uh, and that's how we come up with our categories of sake is all based on the, the milling ratio. So there are a couple different styles of sake. One that is just made with uh, rice, water, yeast, and koji, and another, uh, and that's referred to as junmai, and another where we add a tiny bit of distilled alcohol at the end of fermentation. Um, that is what is known as jozo alcohol, so that's the honjozo side. Uh, we'll get into the Ginjo category. We drop the Honjozo and just call it Ginjo. And we get the Daiginjo category. We drop it again and it's just called Daiginjo. So we have Junmai, Honjozo, Junmai Ginjo, Ginjo, Junmai Daiginjo, and Daiginjo as the categories, the basic categories of sake. Um, and again, as you mill more, you get more elegance, more layered, more complexity because less inhibitors for the yeast to get detracted by. And more ability for them to really create the aromatics and the flavor profiles that they're there to do. Um, we used to call those levels of sake or quality of sake. Uh, 
I'm not so much in that, that category or that thought process anymore. I prefer to think that sake as a daiginjo becomes more expensive because it's more labor intensive. And again, you're milling more of the rice away for a daiginjo, it's below 50%. So at that point, uh, you've spent sometimes twice as much money if you can make a junmai at 80, and a junmai daiginjo at 40, you're using twice as much cereal, which will make the sake more expensive. Um, but again, the beauty of this simple beverage, rice, water, yeast, and koji, very simple, fermented, and delicious. It is delicious. Um, so thanks for that, Chris. I, I know that we could talk all, all day about what is sake and why it's important. Um, sake sales have been growing in the United States, and they continue to see... Um, pretty strong development in, in all different parts of the United States and around the world, uh, places where sake wasn't so popular previously. But I wonder, you know, Jamie, if you could kind of touch on why should restaurants and bars care about building a sake program? Other than, you know, people might be interested, why, why is it important for, for sake and bar, uh, sake restaurants and restaurants and bars to care about sake at this point in time? Um, yeah, I think um, there's, uh, there's a lot of great things that, that sake can do specifically that other beverages uh, can't really. Um, it's one thing that I've thought about uh, quite a bit before I joined my current role, um, where now I sell a, uh, I work at a wholesale uh, distributor um, and we sell to, you know, restaurants, wine shops, things like that. But before that I worked in, uh, restaurants here in New York for many, many years and thought very deeply about, you know, why, um, why sake as opposed to something else. Um, particularly in New York, we get, um, you know, we're flooded with, with so many different options here in New York City specifically. Um, so what, why would, why should someone care specifically about sake versus other beverages was definitely something that I thought about um, a lot. Uh, I think one thing is it is, um, it's extremely, I mean, A, it's as, you know, we were saying, it's extremely delicious. Um, there's certain flavors and sensations and things you can get from it that you can't get from other places. Um, another thing, it's, it's extremely versatile, um, which you can, you know, you can say about wine and a lot of things. I always think of wine kind of as a, a high wire act uh, when you're uh, pairing it with food. You know, wine has, um, compared to sake, a considerable amount of acid with it. And that means that there's certain things that I think wine locks into beautifully. If you find like the right wine and food pairing, it's just, you know, sends you to the moon. But it also, it being a high wire act, um, there are certain times where it just doesn't work at all, um, where it can really clash quite a bit. Um, and sake is something that can work because it's so versatile, it can kind of work with um, certain ingredients and certain foods that wine is maybe not necessarily the, the best pairing for. Um, I think for a long time, uh, even the sake industry itself was trying to sell itself as a replacement for wine, which I think was really kind of a big mistake. It's, it's where we got this uh, from, as far as I, I can tell, it's where we got that phrase rice wine, which you know, a lot of us who were kind of in this whole sake community, we kind of fight against that. It sort of, I think, creates more misconceptions and it actually, um, you know, helps people understand things. Um, so if you, you start taking sake in its own terms, um, there's things that it can do for a restaurant, uh, for any type of restaurant outside of, you know, Asian cuisine specifically, um, that make it something that's very exciting, you know, for you as uh, somebody running a beverage program and, you know, most importantly for the guests. Uh, so kind of specific examples of that, and we can get uh, probably more, I mean, I'm sure other people here have ideas about this. Um, some kind of classic things that come out, um, all kinds of fish roe and fish eggs, caviar obviously being this, you know, kind of very well-known example. Um, I mean, champagne and caviar, you can do it. I, I don't think that um, wine is really the best pairing for caviar. I think a lot of the acids in it just don't, it really doesn't help it all that much. Um, sake and caviar is amazing. Uh, it's something that just really, um, the way sake pairs with food is, like I said, very different than wine. With wine, with these acids really wanting to lock into something where sake kind of sort of lifts up from the bottom, that thing, umami that Chris was mentioning. Um, it really can kind of round out the feeling of a dish. It doesn't really 
punch through or um, contrast to uh, the flavors of, of the food as much as it will kind of envelop it or contrast it, provides a, um, a context to it. Uh, so caviar, I think is a great example. Oysters, I mean, uh, sort of a standard wine pairing is um, really sort of sharp, stony wines. Um, Chibli, you know, a very sort of uh, mineral driven uh, white wine from Burgundy is kind of uh, been said to be like a classic pairing with oysters. I prefer sake. I think it really, um, it washes away a lot of like the really fishy flavors of oysters and really gets you down to the unique specific flavors of that um, that item. And then, and then non-fishy things as well. I mean, uh, cheese is kind of this weird little secret in the sake world. And as I've been discovering in the cheese world as well, you talk to a lot of people who are involved in high-end cheese know that sake is this like amazing um, pairing for a lot of different cheeses specifically. So those are some kind of big classic ones, but there's a lot of other, uh, I think, really amazing opportunities for pairing where really not many other beverages uh, really work. And it's something that as a restaurant operator, if you're really trying to blow people's minds and kind of show them, show them something new, um, sake is something that can do that uh, really, really well. And, you know, as we all know, working with sake in Japan, kind of the quality level and the, the amount of variance you can get from it uh, is amazing. And that's something that, you know, can really provide something real special to your restaurant. Um, so I, I think that hopefully sort of starts that conversation there. I think that's a great start to it. What about bars? What if you're not selling a whole lot of food? You know, is there a place for sake in a in the bar world as well? Uh, I, I mean, for sure. I mean, sake can really fit, you know, <laughs> really anywhere people want to consume alcohol. Um, I've been talking to more and more people who find just, I mean, I, I find this as well. I, I just got back from um, a, a short trip to Europe and was drinking a lot of wine. Um, I mean, I like to drink a lot of different things, but it was not really drinking any sake for about a week or so and just wine. And it's a lot of acid. Um, it can really uh, build up and it, it's something where particularly red wine, you know, you get that tannins and everything. And it kind of gets in your sticks in your mouth um, after you have like more than like a glass or two, whereas sake is just kind of very, you know, much sort of easier on your palate and your system. And, you know, for better or worse, it's easy to drink. Um, it doesn't have, I like to say it doesn't have the breaks that wine has. Wine has the acids and the tannins that can kind of force you to sip it slowly. And, and sake, it's very easy to just kind of, you know, drink it. And it's, um, it doesn't really hit your system. I don't find it hits my system as hard as, as wine does. Yeah. I think in the bar world, and, and Monica, jump in here uh, as a fantastic creator of cocktails, um, that sake, because of the aforementioned umami and, and light acidity, can really work well as a modifier in cocktails. It, it, you, know, you have a floral ginjo that dances with gin extremely well. It can substitute for lele and coche americano and vermouth in, in cocktails. It's a uh, Yamahai Jinmai with tons of umami is great to back up brown spirits. And I think that's where sometimes that use in a bar can be that secret weapon um, in a cocktail uh, and kind of expand things. And bars that are doing smaller snack foods, you know, sake can also be that alternative to that glass of wine that they always have at the bar that's not always um, what people are concentrating on. But because sake is great in cocktails as well, it can also be that alternative lower al alcohol option when they're they're not drinking a cocktail. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, I like to use sake in place of a vermouth. I think it works really well like that with all the aromatics, but just different aromatics. Um, another great thing about sake in bar settings is um, it's, it's just And unexpected and as people want that new cool thing and they're interested in in that thing and we can we can go down lots of rabbit holes with sake and people want to be educated on that yeah so how okay so you four have started multiple sake programs uh, in bars and restaurants in your careers some of you have, are now selling wine uh, selling sake or, or consulting on sake but if a restaurant or bar was at all interested in starting that process and kind of thinking about how to get started in sake, what, what should they do? What sort of advice would you give them? Or how, how do you think about starting a sake program? So 
um, I think there are a couple of us who will, who will respond to this, but just in the beginning is, is first thing is that sake is not scary, right? Don't be afraid of it. It's not this evil beverage that I'm never going to learn about. You know, remember that, you know, when you first studying wine, uh, German wines were very uh, intimidating. And because it's a, a language you might not be comfortable with doesn't mean that you can't uh, figure out the beverage and understand its, its wonderful ability to interact with your cuisine or your bar. Um, I think you start with obviously tasting. Uh, the great thing about the impact that Saki's had over the last uh, 15 years, both in the United States and elsewhere, is that it's not only dominated by the big boys anymore. Um, there's a lot of small craft production products that are out there that you get to really experience where, where a restaurant or a bar is, is bringing in unique and esoteric wines or craft beers or, you know, these, uni these unique items, sake falls right into place with that, right? As a, as a craft product product. Uh, I think the, the building blocks are, you know, people sometimes think, oh, if I'm gonna add sake to my list, I gotta, now I have to do a sake section, or I have to create this big, make this big gigantic effort. It doesn't have to start that deep if you're just stepping into it. Again, depending on where you're, you know, if you're opening a restaurant where you want to have sake be the, to be the star, then that's another process. But in, in the basics of starting a program and introducing it into your restaurant, uh, you know, you can start with, with three or four. Um, kind of get a couple different expressions, reach into the ginjo and get those floral expressions that we mentioned and those fruit notes and reach into a Yamahai Kimoto Junmai area where you're pulling a lot more umami, right? And then to, to oftentimes appease some of the, the newbies into a sake, right? We all know that we often, when we start in a beverage, we start at sweet, right? That's kind of our introduction. Your first, the first time you, you get into brown spirits, you're not drinking, you know, uh, rye, right? You're, you're starting at a, a slightly sweeter bourbon. So in the sense of, you know, maybe that third sake or that fourth sake be a nigori or something that's going to be a little bit more, uh, you know, slightly sweeter so that that's our body, our body loves sugar, right? In all aspects, that's the energy where we derive, right? That's what we drive energy from. That's what gets us going. So it's easier us first to first initially like something that has a little bit of sweetness. Um, that's kind of just the basic ground rule. But if Russell, if you can jump in a little bit, because I know you've done it recently. Yeah, so we started Hanyata this year. We opened in May 7th. And when we were selecting sake, um, it was important for me that the initial entries on our list had good stories. Um, it is something that people want to engage with, as has been mentioned before. You know, sake is very interesting. Not many people have experience with it. So having items on the list that have really good stories means that for the servers and for the customers, it can be a fun experience where you can start engaging over the history of uh, something like Batali Bune and being able to talk about it and it, um, how it, it was created or how the rice was revived. Um, and then looking at things on the list as well and making sure that they are something that you feel passionate about um, and that you can describe the flavors and trying to give people as well uh, an opportunity to give you feedback on um, how they might experience it. Just because you've had hundreds of different sake in your history uh, and you feel comfortable describing it in a particular way, it doesn't mean that somebody on the other side of the counter is going to experience it the same way. And they may not have the same flavor experiences or aroma experiences that you have. And so being able to simplify the language as well that you use around it so that it makes it more attainable. You have to lower the, the entry, the bar to entry for um, sake. So making sure the list isn't too complex, have really good stories, uh, and then use words that may mean something to somebody, um, something that you can have a dialogue over. So let's just let's um, also to just kind of add one quick, um, pretty practical point. Uh, one thing that I mention to people all the time, people who are um, running restaurants or bars and are thinking about adding one or two or three sake just to see how it goes. I mean, they were interested in it. They want to see about introducing it to their guests. Um, as you know, everybody here knows, one of the kind of great uh, sort of properties of sake is that once you open a bottle, um, it lasts for a lot longer uh, than it would a bottle of wine. Um, you know, it's there definitely you're thinking about that at, when you're operating um, a restaurant in terms of cost, like if we're going to bring in this thing, how much sake are we going to sell? You don't have to worry about it the same way you would bring in sort of an esoteric 
unusual wine. I mean, that, that depending on the type of sake, it'll last for um, the most delicate ones. I mean, similar-ish to a bottle of wine in that it will um, kind of lose its finer aromatics after a couple of days. But uh, a lot of um, a lot of great ones will last. To open the fridge several months. The rule of thumb I usually give is two weeks, but honestly, a month. I've tried some types two months after opening that taste better than the day I opened them. Um, and that is something that I think for a lot of people may be considering this, but are kind of nervous about the, the waste of it. Um, you know, that's not something as if you were working with wine. It's, you don't have to worry about possibly trying these things in. And if you don't sell a ton, you know, every time you open one, if you don't sell it all within that first like day or two, like you'll still be able to have that and use it. Um, and even kind of use that the way it, it uh, develops and opens, uh, the, the flavors open up once you've opened up the bottle is kind of another interesting thing to uh, approach and talk about as well. So that, that's one thing I really like to sort of impress on people who are considering this for sure. Yeah, at Daikaya, we offer all of our sake uh, by the glass. Um, we just order the, the larger bottles and are free on, on pouring taste for everybody because I like like you all have been saying um, sake is not scary and I want people to be able to to see that as well. So yeah, we did we did the same thing at Hanyata. It was important for us that everything be sold by the glass. Um, I didn't want to limit it to bottle only because then people can't try it and also those point tastes they matter. Uh, it makes it easier for somebody to understand what you're talking about if you can give them just a sip. And we Sorry, uh, sake not being scary. Um, if you're a restaurant owner, if I, if I wanted to start a restaurant and I had a full wine list built out and a spirits list built out and I was interested in sake, what's sort of the first step to learning about sake? Are there classes or there programs? Are, is there some sort of a, an intro that is easy to get so that I'm not terrified of jumping off the deep end into, into something that I really don't know a whole lot about? There's a lot of information online, um, and especially when you're starting. There are quite a few you know, great courses that are out there by multiple different sources. And, and sometimes depending on you know, your own level or your own commitment, whether you wanna sign up for a, a course that's gonna cost several hundred dollars or more, um, that is up to you. Again, there are quite a few really reputable uh, teachers and, and schools out there. But, a great place to start is online. Search for Sake 101 online and you'll get a ton of information that comes up that are going to give you an opportunity to read and learn a little bit of the basics. But of course, the best way to learn about any beverage is tasting, right? That's really where it starts. You have to be able to experience it because as much as you read, you learn a lot from books and you learn a lot of the language from a book, but until you actually go and experience it by speaking it, you can't, don't really get anywhere. Um, you know, I've had situations where I've been in, in places where when I was in Japan I met several people that you know majored in Japanese in college and all, had all these wonderful things and they got to the community and they couldn't speak yet because all the information in their head but they'd never actually really truly verbalized it in a situation where it was live so as much as we read and, and study stuff online or buy some of the great books by you know various different authors you have this opportunity to to taste and that's really where you can learn about how how to get there and, and experience it. Yeah. I actually watched the Birth of Sake documentary as like my very first thing. And it was not very informative in that like it doesn't tell you what you know the, the different terminology or vocabulary, but just watching them make it really helped me a lot to understand like this is this is the cycle of sake and these are the people involved. I would recommend that. That's great. So for those bars and restaurants not in a major East or West Coast city or in a smaller place around the world, are there key things that, that these restaurateurs or bar owners should know about when considering building a sake program in terms of educating consumers or how to get sake uh, appropriate, appropriately chilled? What are things that you would talk to them about? I mean, first of all, obviously there's, we need to know that, and as I said just a few minutes ago, sake has kind of spread its wings and is available in, in all different uh, parts of the world now, both 
uh, Japanese sake coming being imported slash exported from Japan, but also local breweries that are beginning to to make high quality sake. Um, if there is one near you, that's always a good place to kind of start to learn because you can see the process live and you can taste some unpasteurized sake that will will have some pretty large impact on on your ability to do it. Uh, in the small parts of the world, there's you know importers that have gotten sake all over Europe at this point. There's, uh, you know, in Paris, in London, and in, in again, uh, the main cities, Australia, uh, Brazil is doing really well with sake. So there's, there's many places in the smaller communities in the middle of the United States. Uh, there have been huge steps um, in the amount of sake that's available in all these places. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's breaking out and, and emailing one of the larger importers and asking who do you distribute in my, where do you distribute in my, in my area? Um, how can I get your sakes? Uh, you know, doing a little bit of research on that side to find out what is available. But, uh, and then once, once you find out that easiest way to sell is, is, you know, knowledge is power as we like to say. So, you know, if you're going to be the person leading it, do your, do your research, get your education, um, you know, and then share that with your staff. When anytime you launch a new program or dive into something that's entirely different than what you're used to, um, you know, it becomes a hand sell, right? Just putting sake on your list or just putting sake in your retail shop doesn't mean that sake is all of a sudden gonna jump off the shelf, right? It's the same as any of those other, you know, natural wines or, or, or craft liquors or any of those, those unique beverages, we have to be a participant in it. So, you can't just say, oh, I want to be international. I'm going to put sake on my list. And it, I can't believe it's not selling. We need to, to help educate that. And, and part of that is, is, is what, you know, Russ, Jamie, and Monica have already said that, you know, giving out tastes, uh, you know, putting things by the glass allows the, the staff and your team and then eventually the end consumer the opportunity to experience this beverage in a way that is not so scary. It is scary to go to a, a restaurant, and I see this all the time when I travel around the, the, the US, that they're only selling 300 milliliter bottles and that 300 milliliter bottle costs 10, $12. So whether they double it or triple it, we're, we're breaking in at 24 to $30 for a, a beverage that I've never had. And because of what, what we mentioned about the length of time that a bottle is open, right? That you can keep a bottle open, especially in, in certain styles, Buy the bigger bottle. If you have a month to sell a, a Junmai, for example, if it's a 720 or even if it's a 1.8 liter bottle, there's only 15 servings at a four ounce pour. So you have you you only need to sell a glass less than half a glass a day in order to to move through that sake while it's still in in pretty high quality. Uh, so giving people the opportunity to buy the glass is going to help you when you just jump in it and sell bottles only. It's a big commitment to buy something you've never had. Before. Um, so I think pushing the glass program is important. Hey, Jamie, are 1.8 liter bottles available in the United States? Somebody just asked uh, whether, mm -hmm. um, whether the larger bottles are available. Um, definitely, yeah. Uh, it's something that um, there's plenty of sake types that are only available in 1.8 liters in Japan. Um, so it's something, I mean, they, they sell more of those than they do of the 720s in Japan. It's much more common because they are used to it being more cost effective uh, over there. Um, so I think inevitably, you know, we, we got more of the, the 720s because they're closer to wine bottle size. They're more comfortable just logistically for a lot of reasons. Um, it's uh, been easier to kind of get those over here, but there's quite a bit. Um, and it's something that um, I know on my end, I usually start with the 720s if we're introducing a new product or something. Um, and the 1.8s are available. And once I kind of figure out the interest and in everything, we'll definitely try to get the uh, the larger size ones here because um, they are just more, like way more cost effective uh, for restaurants specifically. Um, and they're also exciting. I mean, anytime I was running a program and you know, if, if we had, yeah, we would sell those 720, you know, bottles, but if you've got one of those big, 1.8 liters just goes through your dining room, it turns heads and suddenly everybody starts asking, oh, what is that table having, you know? Um, and it's, they're exciting for a lot of reasons. It, it's really, you know, I'm sure everybody here would agree with me. Like if you can, uh, if you have the space for those and you can work with it, that's the, a great way to really kickstart a sake program. And carrying a 1.8 liter 
through a dining room, you don't even need to put a sparkler in it. You just carry that through <laughs> and people, people see it. It's great. <clears throat> One of the things we did at Hanyato is introduce a 101 flight and our 101 flight is based only on Ishibin. So we use the 1.8 liters. By doing that, we reduce the price for the customer. And so when somebody comes in and they, they order from our 101 flight, it's, it, they're gonna get uh, uh, three two ounce pours, so six ounces um, that go through the, the polishing grades. So they have a Jumai, Jumai Ginjo, Jumai Dai Ginjo, but coming from Ishibin means that I don't have to worry about it being super expensive. Somebody can come in and they can try sake and then we can have a good talk about, you know, why are there these different grades and what, what really happens to the sake as you go through these different publishing grades. Um, so 1.8 is a really good if you're trying to uh, lower the price for people and then introduce them to sake. Uh, generally the sake tastes better out of those two. Um, it's just a you know, simple matter of you've got less air contact on the overall thing. So the, I uh, have found that, you know, the sake will literally taste a little bit better out of bigger bottles. Don't you find it makes your arm hurt then when you hold the bottle up? <laughs> <laughs> so Russ, when you educate people on sake, I, th I think this is a nice segue because 1.8 liter, 720, it really harkens back to the history of sake, which I find personally very interesting. Do you go into the history of sake when you're educating people, how, how are you talking about sake to consumers who've never talked about sake before? Uh, first of all, I ask permission um, because there are a lot of people who aren't as excited about the thing that they're drinking, or maybe they're more excited to drink than they are to learn. So I ask permission. Uh, do you want to know about history or do you want to know about culture? Or are you interested in any of those things? Um, and if they give me permission, then yes, I'll start talking about it. Maybe talking about how you pour from a tokuri and or um, how you would not pour for yourself or for other people. And then, you know, we can talk about um, uh, if you want more sake, you have to pour for that person. And, and it becomes a fun game, especially when there's somebody sitting at the bar by themselves, then I can pour for them. And um, uh, when we look at the masu as well, um, the 118 mils that come in and then being able to scale that up and talking about it should be in and oh look, you know, it's 1,800 mils, mm -hmm. but that's 10 pours. And um, so we can start having those conversations. So um, I, I asked for permission, but I also invested a lot of time in our menu and made it something that people can read through. Um, I put it toward the back of the menu, um, but giving people um, a glossary or vocabulary of terms so that they can start looking at those and, and read by themselves quietly if they just want to sit and drink. Um, that's been quite provocative. It allows them to start asking questions because now they have words that they can use where before they just had you know, some kind of sensation and they didn't know how to describe it. Um, but it, it's been fun, definitely, um, building uh, experience with the servers so that they can go out and answer questions and then building that rapport with the customer, um, finding the stories that work uh, and also finding glassware that is interesting for customers. Monica, are you able to convince everybody who walks into Daikaya to try sake? Uh, yeah, when I forcibly put it in front of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, that's um, that's an interesting question because at Daikaya we sell more than sake. Uh, we sell Japanese whiskey and shochu as well. So, like those are the three things that I am trying to to get out there. But um, it's it's surprising how many people take to the sake. Uh, as Russell was saying, it, it's important to have the right stories and use the right terminology, um, and you do have to read your guests. I mean, some people they. they they want the whole story, they want the whole background, and some people are just like, well, uh, I normally drink Sauvignon Blanc, and, but this one day I'm willing to drink something else, and then you just have to make it real fast and snappy and choose the sake that you think tastes a lot like Sauvignon Blanc and put it in front of them. But um, yeah, it's, it's important to like really know your product well, tell the right stories, pick the right words. Do you get a lot of customers who are surprised by sake who basically only tried it in a sake bomb or um oh yes really really cheap sake that maybe doesn't taste like the stuff that you're pouring yeah definitely um we're we're located in a very touristy part of town so we get people from every part of the world um and i think for the the best experience for me is when i get somebody who's only had like really bad hot sake 
at a non-Japanese restaurant. And that's, that's all they understand. And they think it's a terrible thing. It's really high proof. Uh, they don't understand what it is. And then I, then I pour them a little bit of something, something nice. And they're like, oh, wow, I never, like, this is sake? This, I don't, I don't understand what this is, but I, I like it. And that's, that's the best moment for me. Yeah, that's, I think sake often gets a bad rap. Um, you know, people have sake once you come and say, oh, would you like to try sake? And they go, oh, I hate sake. And you're like, well, what do you mean you hate sake? That's a pretty strong expression to say you hate something. And I'll say, well, how many times you had it? Well, I had it that one time at that bar. It was hot and just as you described it, alcoholic. And I was like, and that made you hate it? I go, did you hate beer when you had Milwaukee's Best or, or National Bohemian? I mean, like... There, it, it doesn't, and if you're a fan of those beers, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm just throwing out examples. Uh, but we, we were, were willing to try another whiskey, even if we didn't like that whiskey. We're willing to try another beer, even if we didn't like that beer. But sake often gets this, I hate it. And, you know, opportunities of sharing higher quality sake with people and explaining the difference allows us to build on a whole new category of, of individuals that we don't often get that opportunity to talk to because they shut it down pretty quick. Yeah. Jamie, when you talk to um, restaurant owners or bar owners, do they have that same kind of reaction or are they a little bit more open-minded about sake? Oh, sorry, that was directed to me. I missed the sure, first part. That's all right. I mean, I mean, <laughs> you know, when you go and talk to restaurant owners or bar owners, mm -hmm. have they had that same experience that Chris was talking about where they they sort of clam up around sake and, oh, I only tried it that one time. It was hot. It was terrible. And I don't want to go that direction. Or are they a little bit more open-minded? Um, I mean, I'd say it's, it's wide open right now. I mean, definitely you do encounter that um, a lot. Uh, all sorts of folks who have had that one specific experience and they're like, well, I, I was told I should have this, but I don't really like it. And then, you know, you can definitely taste with them and open up. But more so than that, I'm really surprised kind of shocked right now actually that there's this like very organic kind of groundswell movement of people just very interested in Japanese cuisine overall and that's translating a lot into sake um Monica mentioned uh the birth of sake the movie I mean that uh that has done a tremendous amount I think for just getting people aware that this is an artisanal kind of amazing you know category with a lot behind it um so people are treating it with more respect now, even if they don't fully understand it. Um, definitely compared to how I was encountering it like 12 years or so ago when I first started um, selling this in the US, like in restaurants. Um, now I'm getting, then the default sort of uh, reaction was, oh, there's good sake out there, I had no idea. And recently more and more the past couple of years, I'm saying, hearing people say to me like, oh, I know that there's great sake out there and I know that there's a lot of variety. I just don't know what it is really. Um, and also complementary to that, um, like I said, with the whole sort of interest in Japanese cuisine, a lot of people just uh, really reaching out, you know, less me having to kind of go out and really like put it in front of people who aren't interested or maybe weren't considering it, but a lot of people organically coming out, sort of out of the woodwork and kind of asking like, hey, you know, this is, something I'm interested in pursuing and, and interested in doing, um, kind of to a, a surprising degree. I mean, I'd be interested to hear if Chris has had kind of a similar experience since he covers a lot of, uh, a lot of ground selling sake, um, if he's had the same experience with restaurants and things like that. I think, you know, agreeing with Jamie and, and the, the overall energy and the, the groundswell of interest is, is growing. And when you, when people look at sales, they see it, but the, you know, the aha moment is, is always a driving factor for all of us in, in this industry, that moment where someone goes, oh, wait, I didn't know that was going to be amazing. I'm so happy. Yeah. Uh, and that is happening all over the country. I'm selling sake in places and in areas that you're like, wait, you sold how much in that area? You know, like, that's crazy. Um, because there is this open component to it. Sake also... Uh, one of the great things is that in general, sake is considered uh, in the wine and beer category. So for smaller restaurants, for um, places that don't have a full liquor license that, that aren't selling hard alcohol can often jump into this pattern and, and be able to utilize sake as an alternative to their, their just wine and beer. Um, but we are getting, I'm getting people coming out and asking, 
uh, about sake and wanting to try and wanting to learn. And again, with the, the magnitude of incredible sake being brought into the country by all these great importers, uh, the op opportunities and options are, are, are becoming more and more uh, available to everywhere in the country, not just the West Coast and the East Coast, or you know, not just the major cities in Europe. It's it's expanding, and that's that's a really really wonderful thing for all of those restaurateurs and bar owners out there that are looking to start a sake program. It's it's not the same where you had to almost in the past be like, I want to drink sake. I guess I got to start my own import company in order to get the good stuff, right? Like there was that constant searching for more and more, and now that that options those options are there for all all of you out there looking to do it. Um, to get those quality sakes and be able to see how great the beverage is as what we've been discussing in this webinar so far. Yeah, are the licenses the same uh, kind of across the country? Do you know this uh, in terms of whether you just need a beer and wine license to sell sake? Is it the same in, in Seattle and in Washington, D.C.? So every state is different uh, depending on their, their liquor laws that were all established during uh, the wonderful time in America called Prohibition. Um, so Everywhere is different. Most of the places sake is considered, again, uh, wine and beer. Um, but in certain areas, there's rules that say anything over 18% alcohol, you need a, a hard liquor license. So there's places like Texas um, and certain areas of Maryland and, and uh, whatnot that have specific rules to that effect. Um, but in general, most of our sake or a large portion of sake lives below 18%. So you will be able to get um, Sake, you just might not be able to get certain categories like, uh, you know, some some Genshu or undiluted sakes or some of the, you know, higher higher alcohol sakes in those particular areas without a full liquid. So I wonder if we could go to kind of the nuts and bolts of setting up a sake program in a restaurant. Uh, I know Russ, you just did this. Monica, you've done this. Chris and Jamie, you've you've all done this. So if if you're setting up a new sake program what are some pieces that you need to put in place? For example, uh, storage. Um, what sort of glassware do restaurateurs or bar owners need to be thinking about, if, if anything? Um, we've already talked a little bit about how long sake lasts, but are there certain very practical considerations that restaurants and bars need to really be thinking about if they're thinking about setting up a sake program? Uh, refrigeration is key. Uh, you want to keep it chilled, uh, indefinitely after opening it. Um, glassware, I, I think across the board, we've all decided that four ounces is a, is an appropriate pour for sake, uh, both in terms of like the higher alcohol and, um, for price points, uh, sake can get a little bit expensive for guests. You know, it's not it's not um, weird to see like a $20 glass of sake um, if, you, if you do a typical wine pour, but if you keep it at four ounces, it's a little more approachable. Um, anyone else want to jump in? I mean, I think glassware, there, there, there can be some incredible glassware that really generates, um, you know, impact for sake, but if you're starting to test this out, you don't have to go out and buy brand new glassware. If you're opening a restaurant that's specifically Japanese and that's gonna be a part of your program because those glasses are integral to the story you're telling, but if you just wanna get started, you know, wine glasses, sherry glasses, uh, you know, smaller glasses all work in that component. So you don't necessarily have to search out a brand new glass for this program. If and when sake really takes off, there are some amazing sake specific glasses. Um, you know, I just did a, a pairing in DC where we were, you know, the, the place wanted to use different glasses during the tasting to kind of to show different things. And I had to taste each sake in, in all these different vessels because there were certain glasses that even though they're a wine glass and we say it's okay to use wine glasses, it didn't work. Right? Some sakes in burgundy glasses are genius and other sakes in burgundy glasses just smell like and taste like alcohol, right? So, you know, there, there is a thing about just saying any glass will work isn't necessarily true, um, but in general, more classic, smaller glass, or even a whiskey um, dram uh, glass works great for, for sake. 
Um, so the two, two points I, I guess I'd like to fill out, uh, building on what Monica and Chris said. Um, I think I, I'm really glad that Monica mentioned the four ounce pour has kind of become the standard. I'd say that's, um, that's really my experience. I mean, that's the short answer I give most people. Um, another thing I like to point out about that is you get uh, almost exactly, well, exactly if you're doing it you know, correctly, uh, six four ounce pours out of a single 720 bottle. So it's, it gives you exactly, you know, modularly what you need. There's not stuff left over, things like that. Um, the other thing, I get a lot of people asking that glassware question, and a lot of people seem really concerned with like, well, what's correct? You know, they, they, want, they don't want to just, like if we're bringing in sake, they don't want to do it in a way that seems like, you know, silly or frivolous or not treating it in a way that's, you know, not giving it its full respect. But um, as, you know, we all know here who um, have worked, uh, you know, been in Japan, like work with sake in Japan, um, even over there, they don't have a, a standard for how they're serving it. I mean, I've gone to all kinds of bars and restaurants in Japan and some are using, you know, wine glass stemware, some are using, um, you know, the traditional way is ceramics and cups, but that's by no means the way you have to serve it. Um, so to build on what Chris was saying, you know, not only is it, um, you know, easy and, and good to use if you have existing stemware for wine that you're using to use that, it's also, it wouldn't be considered inappropriate in any way, which is something that a lot of people seem to, if they're bringing in sake, they want to do it correct. It's definitely not, not only is it not a problem, it's actually great to be able to serve it um, that way. So really what you have is good, but then if, even if you are going out to get specific things that to really show it off well, um, glassware can be great for that and not having to get sort of specialty ceramics or anything like that. Yeah, so for restaurants um, out there who do kind of a full dinner menu, uh, what do you think about dessert sakes, sparkling sakes? How do you think about incorporating those elements into a, into a program? Are you interested in that? Does that spark a light in you? Does it not? Do you find it kind of outside the realm of real sake? How, how do you think about these things? I would put that to the two people running restaurants right now. <laughs> yeah, Monica, Russ, what do you think? Uh, we have a couple uh, sakes that we put under the dessert category, just I think to help people better understand what they might be drinking. So earlier we were talking about the Tamagawa time machine, which is this very I think it's delicious. You, it's delicious, <laughs> but if you if you if you like give it to somebody right off the bat, I think they would be uh, surprised and maybe not ready for it. But if you yeah. if you put it in the dessert section, um, I think people better understand it. It's like, oh, this is meant to be consumed at the end of the meal. This is like um, maybe this can fill in for dessert, but but I, that that's a uh, I think that's an appropriate place to put it. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question, I am thinking about dessert sake and other types of sparkling. Um, what about you, Russ? <laughs> so we do, we don't have like, uh, oh, this is a dessert thing, but um, thankfully working with uh, Chef Soma, um, she does care a lot about pairing. And so um, what might happen is on our Instagram um, feed, we might uh, suggest, you know, this and this. So uh, she made uh, potato salad, so you shouldn't try it with uh, uh, Tadori Gawa Kinka. Um, and uh, through those, uh, through that social aspect of, of um, talking about the food that's coming out and then suggesting a pairing um, and also working with our staff to make sure that, you know, they've tried sake with some of our food and try you know different sake and giving them a chance as well to pick a sake and then decide that it's completely the wrong match it means that they're able in real time to engage with people and, and suggest pairings um, but we haven't set up our menu so that it's targeted and saying you know, this is a dessert sake and you should drink it at this part of time um, there we had I was joking earlier we had secret meat for a while and uh, secret meat was um, a big uh, ham on and uh, people would come in and, and they'd order the secret meat um, and we would serve it with um, a red maple. And red maple is this really nice aged namazake uh, and it has a, a, the, the two pair very well together. Um, 
turning it into a kind of a game um, that pairing became really popular uh, we found with uh, adults they like to play games just as much as as kids do and when alcohol is involved you have to be careful of the game no but uh, we, we keep the, the caps from the top of um, the issue bin and above the bar there are a whole load of holes i'm reaching up because i'm sitting at the bar at the moment a whole load of holes and so when people finish bottles they take the bottle cap and put them in the in the, in the wall um, but that pairing thing as well, uh, when, when people find a good pairing, then we'll promote that to other people. Oh, so-and-so just at the end of the bar is eating that and they really like this particular sake with it and they think it's a good thing and allow the pairing to happen organically. I think, I think these, these sparkling or dessert or other sakes are, are somewhat modern innovations and the sake styles and and platforms are continuing to develop as much as we talk about sake being a very very old beverage daiginjo ginjo uh etc in the categories of where we're able to mill below 50 percent and and mill to these quantities is a much newer concept in the overall age of sake um you know so being overtly against something or an uh, or too much of a tradi traditionalist per se you know that that we're not open to other things. Bodai moto, a much older process of sake production, has now come back into favor, and people are getting stoked about it. There's people using 300-year-old recipes. There's there's lots of return to kimoto and yamahai styles, and and you know movement back because the modern sake that we know of of sokojo is is a, something that only started last century, right? So. A lot of this is relatively new, so this is just the next step, the next level of experiment. We'll let it see if the if the demand requires it to, to stay or not. There are some really fabulous uh, sparkling sakes out there. There's some interesting takes on what kijoshu or sweet sakes are at this point um, as well, and and some are phenomenal and some are not. But that's true of of, of all the beverages out there in this world that they're. There are things that you fall in love with and there are things that you're like, I understand that that was a, a crap beverage that the person making it took a lot of time and, and appreciate what they did, but it's not to my liking. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be to someone else's liking because as much as we all educate about flavor profiles and what things taste like and thoughts, you know, we are trying to be objective, but tastes are subjective. So we have to allow mm -hmm. other people to enjoy a beverage that I might not personally be in love with but it's, if it has a calling, it, 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 it should be allowed to exist. Um, I would also kind of jump in um, and say sort of at the beginning, um, Bernie, the way you, you phrase the question, talk, sort of talking about like, well, dessert sake, things like that. Um, I found that there's a lot of really terrific sake that do have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sweetness to them and richness that kind of, I saw in other, like when I was managing restaurants, I would see in other uh, beverage programs as they would just throw it in the dessert sake category and just leave it by the bottle and they wouldn't sell any and we would find a pairing for it within the meal um the way russell was talking about the the red maple uh with hamon something like that i mean i've seen the red maple put on as a dessert sake at places because it is quite rich um i think stuff can get lost in there honestly um i mean i love to have kind of an after dinner sweet drink thing but i don't think that's necessarily super super common um but a way you can I, I wouldn't just necessarily think of those things that do have a sweetness and a richness to them just to put them in the dessert um area and sort of hope that they move there that you can find certain pairings for them um there's a sort of very small but kind of emerging category of sake uh called all koji sakes which use um 100 percent uh, of the koji rice as opposed to um, using the steamed rice and they are super rich and I was taught by a guy I worked with a really great Somalia that I worked with many years ago um, he was pairing that uh, with savory and rich dishes um, whereas pretty much every other restaurant I've seen that would sell it as like a dessert sake and it was something that would blow people's minds I mean when he did it um, I stole that uh, trick from him and did it at like really two other programs afterwards that I worked at. And it was something that like the staff got behind it. I'd pour it in front of guests and they would just flip out um, because this pairing was so kind of unique and different and amazing. Um, so that's one definitely piece of kind of maybe insight that I got of it that I put out that it, it sounds like Monica and Russell are, are doing as well, which is not to just, if something's rich and sweet, don't just necessarily put it in the dessert thing and maybe pair it with something 
you know, a dessert, but like see where else could it could fit. Um, Cause there are some surprising uh, matches out there. I mean, those sweeter ones, foie gras and kijoshu was a classic one. Um, I worked at a place called, uh, oh yeah, that was my last restaurant job before I came here. And I didn't come up with this, but the owner, Nancy Cushman is a crazy sake fanatic. I mean, she loves it. And they've paired, li literally there's a dish that they've done for probably over 10 years now, 12 years maybe, originally in Boston. Um, it's foie gras, uh, sort of over sushi rice, paired with a very rich kijoshu. And it's it's literally comes out automatically like that. You can't not, you can't get the foie gras dish and they, and they will always serve you the sake with it. Like it's, it's built into the cost. It's put out there. Um, and it's something that they've always done. And I discovered a few other things like that. Um, but really want to just kind of put that out there as sort of a, a way to, um, to think about it and get people excited. Cause those are the ones that really, I saw the most impact uh, from guests with for sure. Well, it's like when you, when you take, we, sometimes we do these, these things with sake and divide it into the categories and, and, and put sweet sakes and, and those things into dessert, like what everybody's been saying. But you look at Sautern and you look at some other wines throughout the world and where they get paired with is not necessarily ever with dessert. It's with other things, with spice, with, with foie gras, with rich. And so that concept is, is something that we just have to let everybody who's doing it besides us as quote unquote sake specialists, but but even the Psalms out there, if they don't pigeonhole sake into one area, let it become this item that is to your benefit. It's something that you can you know, keep in your back pocket or in your repertoire to kind of blow people away and give them that experience. They're coming to you as the Psalm for, right? I'm coming to you to get an experience. I'm coming to this place to have an experience that I haven't, I haven't had before. And sake is this wonderful opportunity to kind of totally blow people away, as Jamie said earlier, with this with these pairings and these co these complexities that exist in this beverage that you can't necessarily get from a wine pairing uh, so i think sake really needs to live in in those areas when possible and and again sake is not scary just have to taste it and play with it and then and then you'll be able to inter introduce it to your programs without that fear or that stress of oh no i can't do it so I want to just take a, a second to let all the viewers know that we are taking questions. If you do have a question for the panelists, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A box and we'll try to get to it. Um, I want to ask a question from one of the viewers here. You know, Monica and Russ's restaurants are in the Japanese realm. Um, Jamie, Chris, when you're selling sake, what portion of the sales are to Japanese or Asian restaurants as opposed to non-Asian restaurants? Jamie, you go first. <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely, um, like, like I said, I've, I've seen a tr uh, tremendous amount of interest from non-Asian restaurants recently. Um, but definitely in terms of overall, like what I sell, um, it's the, in terms of volume of sales, it's definitely still coming from uh, Japanese and Asian places. Because I think um, that's, a, that's a customer thing. I mean, it's, when I was... Um, well, to give an example, I've, I've got some friends who opened up a, uh, this great sort of uh, high-end fine dining Japanese place here in New York um, about two, two three years ago. Um, and they were, they were people that came from a wine background. And they built out this amazing wine program. I mean, a really world-class champagne list, all this stuff. Um, and they'd, I'd, I'd talk to these guys a lot about what they could do for sake. And um, definitely worked on that. And they're like, oh, but we're really going to, you know, we've got all these world-class wines that we know can work with this food. We're really going to be selling this wine. And they were kind of shocked that, you know, no matter how much they can talk about wine and they could definitely sell a lot of these high end things, naturally people came in, even if they were wine, people would sit down in the Japanese restaurant and be like, no, I'm at a Japanese restaurant. I really want sake right now. Um, so in terms of volume, just because that is still, I think the way, most sake is consumed and how people think about it. It's sort of, you know, as a restaurant, you don't really, if you're an Asian restaurant or specifically a Japanese restaurant, you don't really have to sort of um, put it in front of the customer or show that amazing pairing. It's just kind of automatically people are like, sure, give it to me. And then it's a question of, um, you know, maybe finding a specific thing that they may particularly respond to and like, or something that goes very well with the food. Um, that being said, I, I'm just getting more and more and more interest from non-Asian places. I mean, I'd say it's probably about 
um, I have to look at my numbers specifically, maybe 30% to non-Asian restaurants for me, um, 70% to more kind of conventionally Asian type things. Um, but that non-Asian part is growing for sure. And I get, you know, I mean, I, just before I got in this call, I was fielding a couple inquiries from non-Asian places that wanted to sit down and talk sake and see about it. Chris, are you finding the same thing? Yes, I mean, I think in the those East Coast, West Coast, uh, big cities, uh, big restaurant driven uh, areas are gonna be a little bit more experimental and New York is gonna be spread out a little bit more to the non-Japanese areas. Again, when you're going into new neighborhoods and, and trying to branch out sake, when I talk to my uh, distributors, I you know you kind of say, start with the low hanging fruit, right? So <laughs> Japanese restaurants and, and Asian based restaurants are gonna be the easier place to introduce sake to. But as we you know get more airtime uh, and more exposure and more high end restaurants that are Inter integrating sake into their programs and and putting it on their pairing menus that exposure is a trickle down theory and it will continue to bring new people aboard right um, you know i've been lucky enough to get some pairings on some very non japanese you know pairing menus across the country and everybody's going crazy for it and they're like okay what when the next menu what sake should we do for the next one or what you know what should we pair come in and taste me on new things so I think it is it is definitely growing, expanding outside of that that classic realm. But we are still, as the group here and, and all of the people in, in sake sales across the country, we're trying to, to push that envelope and trying to get more and more people to be excited about sake and what it can do outside of, of the Japanese you know, restaurants or the Asian restaurants. You know, I, I say to Sams, and this is something that comes to me quite often, or someone, especially when I'm out in smaller markets, and they'll be like, oh, well, uh, Japanese sake doesn't work with my cuisine. And, and my response generally is, I didn't know that we paired beverages with countries and or cuisines, I thought we paired it with food, right? So, you know, if we're gonna stick by that, certain wines and certain beverages are only allowed to pair with the cuisine from where they're from, and we know that's not true. So sake, because of its ability to pair and its uniqueness, is welcome everywhere. Sometimes we just have to get in front of that Sam or in front of that chef and, and show them the brilliance of sake. And once they have it, then they go, oh, wow, uh, I really, I'm really i really interested in bringing this in. Again, none of us want you to rethink your entire list at a non-Japanese restaurant and, and go and put 40 sakes on there. But creating, creating something that goes in your pairing list and having a few examples so that you can really shine and blow some people away you know, Jamie mentioned all sorts of pairings earlier, oysters, etc. These are something that are served at all different restaurants, and sake really is a genius uh, component that brings out the beauty of a lot of these foods. It helps elevate the foods around it because of that umami. Um, and, and that's something that the more we learn, the more we, we expose the community to, the Sam community too, and the restaurant tour community too, the more sake will continue to grow. It is technically one of the largest per percentage growth per year category over and over again for the last 15 years. Um, now, when you're starting small growth can, is always gonna be exponentially higher than some place that's vodka that's already at a gazillion cases or whatever it is, but sake does continue to grow at, at a rate above 10%, which is double digit growth every year for 20 years. I don't care how small it started, that's still a, a very impressive number and the community wants it. So we, you know, let's get it to them. That's great. Um, th there's one other question that's been posed and I think we've touched on this a little bit, but I'm gonna throw it out to the collective group here. Uh, how do you help people understand the matrix of price point value and size serving? Go. <laughs> <laughs> the matrix. Um... <laughs> how do you think about price point value and size serving like when you buy a bottle or when you're when you're looking at a wholesaler or distributor how do you think about those things um so um where i work we have a uh we, we have about a 75 percent markup um 
wait, am I saying that right? Well, basically we want to keep our costs at around 26%. Um, for, for sake, we lump it into wine, unfortunately, which, uh, on, which means that when guests come in, it is at a higher uh, price point than what they're used to seeing, um, which, which is why the four ounce pour works so well, um, because then you're getting like 12 to $15 glasses, and that seems to sell pretty well. Um, I see that there's a question being posed about um, if you're a retailer uh, at a wine shop and you don't have the luxury of being able to pour tastes, um, I would say try out the, the smaller bottles. There's the 300 ml size or even sell the little like 180 milliliter cups. They're really cute most of the time and people like that. Okay. That can be a, an easy point of entry where you can get this single serving and you can keep the cup and you can use it for your pens or whatever. Um, and, and I think people see value out, out of that. Like, oh, was a little thing I can keep. Um, okay. I haven't explicitly done it. Um, we have sake, um, a sake flight, or actually we have a bunch of different flights. But in the flight, um, you get six ounces, split, um, three different sake for the uh, two ounce pours. And um, we, I, I work very hard to get the price right for us for this particular space, but make it a price that people are willing to pay. Um, and so I pick sake very carefully to go into those. Um, but from that flight, what we would say is, you know, the next thing is maybe a four ounce pour. And if there was a particular sake that somebody liked in that flight, then we'll give them a dollar off that, that four ounce pour. And then in the menu itself, when we put the prices of four ounce, eight ounce for a tokori and then the bottle price, I, it, I haven't explicitly attempted to answer the question, but I think the numbers explain that they're getting you know, certain discount as they order larger amounts of sake. Um, and then everything that we sell by the glass here, we also uh, have retail. Um, so all of the bottles, even we ship in, we put uh, retail prices out and we don't try and hide those. Um, and people can see that the in-house bottle price is higher than if they took the bottle home and drank it. Uh, again, I don't explicitly talk about it. Um, it's actually quite a provocative question for me asking, you know, what do I do? I don't do anything and now I feel bad. I mean, I think the Monarch answered the question well for the retail side. Um, you know, to me, to some extent, 300 milliliters are the bane of a restaurant's existence because of the price, price point I mentioned earlier, but they are a huge friend to the retailer um, uh, because of that ability to get someone to try something and it not having it be crazy expensive and they don't have to commit to a bottle that's going to cost them 30, 40, 50 dollars. Um, and, and buy those smaller, those smaller sizes in retail. I think eventually they start with that and then someone understands that they love sake. When you go up in size, you will get a better cost per ounce even at retail. Therefore, as you build your program, build your program. So start with the smaller options and then build up to, to larger bottles so that, that your, your, your consumer or your, your, your customer can get those, those options. For me, in, in, in restaurants, the matrix of pricing, I think, one of the things that we can do because sake is is not as perishable as wine in most of its experiences, again, except for something that's, you know, a, a, a daiginjo, a nama, nama nama daiginjo that, that is super floral and it loses it relatively quickly. Most of your sake can be, can be priced, uh, as we said, by the ounce with the understanding that we are not going to lose uh, anything out of this bottle versus how we price wine. It can be a little bit more like hard liquor in that thought process of pricing in the restaurant. Um, I also think, and I've, I've said to certain places, depending on their, their, their structure, if you go to a, a, a craft beer place nowadays, right? A lot of the pricing ranges from eight, nine to, to 15, right? But and, and maybe 15 being the higher, higher end for, for things that are on draft, but the, the ounce pour changes, right? I may get a sour that costs me 10 bucks, but I only get four ounces, but I can get a Pilsner for the same 10 bucks and get 16 ounces. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the concept of trying to provide something 
more affordable. And when you get to that Daiginjo, put three ounces in and lower the cost so it becomes more price effective for that consumer. Now, that has to do with a little bit more training with your, with your, your team to make sure they're pouring the right amounts for the, the certain beverages. But I don't see that as a bad, I, I see like that's an opportunity because people are already used to it. Right, we're dealing with another craft beverage, like we're dealing with the craft beer movement. Sake is a craft, handcrafted, generally small family owned breweries that are creating these things. It doesn't mean that we can't adjust the ounce pour, right, based on price point to keep it competitive and keep someone coming for it. You know, that's another idea. I'm not saying everybody has to adopt that, but that's something that is a possibility in that world of trying to keep pricing fair. Um. Well, I think we're sort of coming to the end of the program here. Uh, I want to thank each one of the, the panelists, Russ, Monica, Chris, and Jamie. I wanted to give you each an opportunity, just kind of a last word to somebody who's either, who either owns a bar or restaurant or is thinking about setting up a sake program. Uh, sort of last word thoughts on what they should be thinking about or what they should be doing. Why don't we start with Russ? I think for me, um, what, was very important right at the beginning is that I met the other people in the community selling sake and um, being able to think of them not as competitors, but as uh, people who are helping me increase the number of uh, sake drinkers in Seattle. Um, I spend time in their different places drinking their sake and drinking from their list. I also know what they're selling. I try very hard not to have significant overlap so that we can uh, direct people to other places. I think it's important that um, you get some kind of uh, loyalty from your customer base. But I also like the fact that, um, oh man, that's the wrong word. I was gonna say humans are promiscuous, but I meant in terms of going to different places to get different things. And so being able to give them an opportunity to go somewhere else and try something else, um, is like, then they can come back and they can tell you a story and they can say, you know, I had a Tokoyama at this particular restaurant and I really liked it, do you have it? No, I don't, but I have something similar. And so you can start broadening their experiences. Uh, so for me, um, when we opened Hanyato, it was you know, thinking about being part of that community of sellers as well as being there for the community of drinkers. That's great, Monica. Uh, I'd say educate yourself and know your product well, but don't be uh, too pretentious about it. Uh, I think we're dealing with a product that is still fairly esoteric and it's easy to think that you know what's best for everyone and that you have you have the best product but listen to your guests and make sure you're serving something that people enjoy yeah, chris uh, i mean i think one thing to always remember is as kind of what was touched on that this is a, a new beverage and different, but it is alcohol and remember to try and have fun. So we can be as serious as we need to be about, you know, educating when we need to educate. But again, this is alcohol. This is, this is served for enjoyment and, and don't take yourself or the beverage too seriously. Respect the brewer and respect the, the product, but at the same time, you know, try, try and have fun with it and, and don't be afraid to enjoy yourself and, and enjoy it with your guests so that everybody's having a good time and remembering, well, what a great time I had with Saki. That was so awesome. We got to go back there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jamie, why don't you uh, wrap us up? All right. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure there's much more I can add um, that hasn't really been expressed by other people. I guess uh, maybe just emphasizing the point that um, you don't really need to uh, really employ much jargon. Uh, and much of the specialty words to be able to sell this stuff. Um, I think being able to just convey it um, in your own words in a way that makes sense to you. And um, definitely an experience I've had a lot here at my company that I, you know, I'm sort of the sake specialist in my company, but we've got um, a ton of salespeople who basically come out of wine. And some of the most effective ones are the people who aren't trying to play expert uh, when they go and talk to their accounts uh, about this. They're not trying to like overwhelm their accounts by saying like, oh, I understand these categories and you need to know this, that, and the other thing. Um, they really approach it as sort of this collaborative, like, hey, here's this really cool um, thing. I, I don't, you know, you know, I, I, I'm learning about it. I don't fully understand it, but isn't this exciting? And I think taking that same kind of attitude, which is something that 
really, you know, Monica and Russell and other people have expressed of just sort of, um, you know, be excited about it and don't feel like you need to um, show that you've got this full understanding of all these terms necessarily, that just sort of the enthusiasm will come through a lot better. And um, that's really more important than anything else. Because I do get a lot of people who feel kind of intimidated by that, um, the, all the terminology around sake and, and needing to present it in this authentic way, where I, I don't think um, as long as it's served with respect, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, I want to then uh, thank Russell King, the co-owner of Hanyuto Restaurant in Seattle, Monica Lee, the beverage director at Daikaya, Chris Johnson, Sake Ninja, and uh, Jamie Graves, the Japanese portfolio manager at Skernick Wines and Spirits in New York City. Thank you guys so much for talking to everybody about sake, sake education, bar and restaurant world. Um, my name is Bernie Baskin. I'm the executive director of the Sake Brewers Association of North America. If you want to learn more about us, uh, head to sakeassociation.org, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.